Top Med Talk. Thank you for joining us during this session. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, the next speaker who is, we've been up here all day, but I don't know if you know this or not, but he's a fellow Kentuckian. So we're all from America, from Kentucky. So uh, Mike Manning is going to talk to us about the opioid crisis that is happening in the U.S. that I think, you know, may be starting to happen here in the U.K. and, and abroad, but um, definitely is a major e- epidemic in um, the United States of America. So we're going to hear a little bit about um, his perspective and our perspective on that. So thank you so much, Mike. <clears throat> so to start off, does anybody know where this is or what this is? The ether dome. That's right. It's the ether dome, not the ether and opioid dome. <laughs> okay. So um, welcome back from the break. Still no disclosures. Still hopeful, though. So what I want to talk about today is... Um, kind of discuss the prevalence of post-operative pain uh, and build on some of the things that Evan talked about, discuss the potential benefits of an opioid-free and opioid-reduced enhanced recovery after surgery protocols, and the learning that we obtained at Duke while we were implementing some of our pathways. So like he alluded to earlier, uh, this is uh, the study that looked at post-operative pain over a 20-year span. This was done by T.J. Gann while he was at Duke. And you can see from 1985, or sorry, 1995 to 2003 to 2014, the distribution of pain that patients experience after surgery hasn't really changed. We haven't moved the needle very far. Now, why is that? It's because our practice of pain management hasn't really changed over the course of years. We still largely impart practice monotherapy with opioids. So as patients have pain, they get opioids. More pain, more opioids, severe pain, severe opioids. Now when you ask patients and you survey patients about what do they desire, what are their interests, they would much rather tolerate some levels of pain than incur the side effects of opioids. By far and away, they want to avoid the nausea, the vomiting, They're kind of 50-50 on the constipation, but they don't want to have the mental cloudiness that's associated with opioids. Now, we know that opioids uh, do increase post-operative pain. This is a study that looked at patients undergoing hysterectomy that had either low-dose fentanyl or high-dose fentanyl intraoperatively. And then the outcome was looking at post-operative opioid use and the recovery by PCA. And you see that Patients reported higher pain after being exposed to higher doses of opioid in the operating room. Statistically, out to eight hours, but still a little higher, out to 16 hours. But what was interesting in this study is is that the opioid use by PCA was about two to three times higher out through 16 hours. So the patients that received high-dose fentanyl intraoperatively required higher doses of fentanyl to maintain an adequate pain score. This is PCA, they're treating themselves. So we know that opioid exposure can cause hyperalgesia and acute tolerance. This is another study looking at patients undergoing laparoscopic cholecystectomies. They were divided into three groups. Fentanyl group, the classic way we would treat a patient, substituting esmolol for the fentanyl, and then maintained on remifentanil. And when you look at opioid use in the recovery period, just the substitution of esmolol alone decreased uh, recovery room opioid use by almost half. And you see that exposure to remifentanil increased opioid requirements. Another study that looked at the implementation of an ERAS pathway, a lot like what we had done at Duke, um, only changing the intraoperative opioid use and looking at how that changed opioid prescriptions at the time of discharge. And what they found was, is that after implementation for a year of reduced intraoperative opioids, they did not experience a change in prescribing practices at their institution. So there is a certain amount of patients that will convert to chronic opioid use or persistent opioid use and database uh, registrar data for several thousand patients at different age groups show that this conversion is somewhere between 3% up to 6.5%. Now, that's probably a little uh, 
exaggerated high. Uh, I think the average is around two to three, like Evan mentioned. So there was recently a POKI, perioperative quality initiative, that looked at um, kind of the opioid crisis and the opioid epidemic and made some recommendations for that. And one of the things that they noticed was is that uh, in their groups, they looked at different uh, surgery types, and they found about a 2 to 3% conversion to chronic or persistent opioid use. Now, in this paper, it's a very good paper, well done. Uh, the definition of persistent opioid use is quite varied, and they, they go through a very detailed list of what persistent opioid use actually means. Most studies will truncate that from 90 days to 180 days. And persistent opioid use uh, occurs over a range of surgeries, both minor procedures and major procedures. And you can see that um, this incidence of new opioid use or persistent opioid use, as it was reported in JAMA surgery, uh, is around 6% to 8%. And we all know that opioid-related deaths are increasing. This is data from the CDC Uh, looking at data from 2010 to 2016, and I've truncated the first 21 states of the U.S. and showed that this is a consistent problem across all states. Opioid-related deaths are increasing. Now, where this comes from, so more than about 50 million patients uh, will undergo surgery, and about 80 to 90 percent of those will be prescribed opioids for post-operative pain control. And If you're generous with your estimates, about 6.5% of patients, that's 2.5 million patients, or 2.6 million will continue on with opioids. Of those, about half a million will become addicted to opioids. Now, where do they get the opioids? It's from leftover pills, like Evan mentioned. Ready access to this. 70% of patients, or 70% of the prescriptions go unused. 90% of these remain in the home. And 32% of those patients who became addicted reported that their first exposure was to these opioids. And this is estimated to cost us about $13 billion to treat this. So these problems are universal. They're everywhere. But the solutions are local. So how are we going to fix this? And I mentioned this in our talk before, how we looked at our practice at Duke and realized there was areas for opportunity to improve. And so we undertook a, a protocol to do that. So the question that I was asked to talk about is, can we take opioids out of the perioperative space? I think it requires us to think about how we manage patients, move away from the traditional fundamental principles of opioids first. If you can block things, block things. Rely on regional techniques, uh, uh, non-opioid medications first, and then build on that, and then reserving opioids at the end. Now, pain management is and should be, I think, thought of as a continuum through the surgical process. As a patient moves through this, they're going to encounter different practitioners in different areas of the hospital. Uh, Each person, each area has its own unique culture and belief system about opioids, and I think that that is unrecognized areas for opportunity for improvement. And ERAS has done an incredible job over 15 years standardizing practice of fluids, hemodynamic uh, stability, and and maintaining hemodynamic stability through cases, um, maintaining ventilation, getting patients up, moving, improving gut motility. But I think we have done a poor job so far in not really recognizing the opportunity for multimodal anesthesia and analgesia throughout this continuum. So one of the things that we wanted to do and we think can be done is remembering what patients value. They'll tolerate a little bit of pain to avoid the side effects, right? And so looking at that, that has led us to look at where we can approach certain patients. Now, this is a technique that you have to use clinical judgment, but it it should be considered a tool in the the toolkit. Look for patients that have a history of post-operative nausea vomiting, a desire to return to full function, to full function. How motivated are they? Are they going to participate in this? Um, and then I was talking with a couple of people at break, and I think it's very important, and something that we need to do is have a standardized message to patients. And I think the earlier that the patients get this information, the better off. And we practice this with our surgeons, and we have a very clear, defined um, 
script that we give the surgeons. And it's very clear, we believe, in how we communicate that to the patients. So we tell them and we realign their expectations. A two to three out of 10 is where we expect your pain to be. That's very reasonable. And a lot of patients we found don't really understand when I say a 10 out of 10 pain, 10 being the worst you've ever had. What is that? I stub my toe on the, on the counter in the bedroom at night. And that, to me, that's a 10, right? But post-surgical, that's probably not. So we say, okay, a 5 out of 10 is where if you're working in the garage and you pull a back muscle, that's going to take you out of the game. You say, honey, sorry, uh, I'm going to go in and lay on the couch with a heating pad. We describe the symptoms and the sensation of abdominal cramping that comes from abdominal distension, the referred shoulder pain later that evening. We tell them where that comes from and what that is, and the expectation is, is that if we can get you up moving and mobilize you quicker, you'll do better. That will resolve by itself. Um, usually takes about 12 to 24 hours, and opioids don't really treat that pain very well. So we also remind them that patients, um, that chronic use uh, can lead to uh, tolerance. It can lead to heightened sensation of pain. And so we're going to do these multimodal pathways first. We're not going to restrict you from opioids, but we're going to use those last. And so, like I mentioned before, this is our cocktail that we use. And then when we go in, we, we go into the interoperative space and we um, try to minimize the opioid exposure as much as we can. Still treating for pain. We're not completely uh, removing analgesics. In the PACU, we are going to treat pain um, and um, use medications that are non-sedating. So we get patients awake, hopefully a little mentally clearer, quicker, so that if there is some discomfort, they can communicate that to us quicker. We can fix it faster. And, of course, building dashboards to change your practice. You know, if you want to change it, you have to measure it. And so what kinds of things can we do to move the needle as far as opioid use? Understanding that opioid-free anesthesia is possible, it may not always be appropriate for the patients. You have to assess your patients and the surgery that they're undergoing and evaluate them moving forward. But certainly... Um, realigning expectations with the patient and having that message communicated to them by the surgeons, having it communicated by the nursing staff, have the nursing staff on the floor uh, recapitulate this message to the patients and understand how do we assess pain? How are the questions we're asking? Are we asking you, do you hurt? Probably not the best question to ask. Are you comfortable? Is there anything I can do to help improve uh, your situation? And then certainly look for opportunities along the way where you can minimize opioid exposure. This is, I think, the way that we'll move the needle and try to minimize opioid exposure. It's not to do away with it. It's not a pendulum switch to the extreme. It's, I think, better stewardship. And that's what I would really want the take-home message to be, better opioid stewardship. Thank you very much. David Jerison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, before we let you go, it's important that we remind you to subscribe to Top Med Talk. That way you'll never, ever miss another episode. Also, if we could encourage you to join us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, pretty much every single social media platform, we're there. Join us. And finally, check out Top Med Talk. Dot com. If you go to our website, you can subscribe to email updates. That way we can always tell you where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing and how you can join us. Topmedtalk.com and click on the section marked email updates. Finally, Top Med Talk is proud to act as the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about them as well. EBPOM.org is their website. That's E-B-P-O-M.org. And if you go to EBPOM.org forward slash meetings, you can find out about some of the wonderful meetings that we attend and cover across the year here on Top Med Talk. That's EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.